I said, I am the education coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture, coordinating local outreach, our education programs, including professional development workshops and some other things partner related as well. Um, our organization is based here in the Twin Cities, uh, but we have partners all over the country, all working in our main program areas of habitat, education, science, and partnerships. So we have staff in each of these program areas, all working with our partners and with our, the public, um, anybody who really wants to be involved on conserving the monarch butterfly and its migration. These partners are from all over the United States. We are a US-based organization, though we do work with our colleagues to the north and to the south of us. Um, you might recognize some of the logos on this slide. <laughs> the, uh, the federal agencies, nonprofit partners, uh, university research uh, centers, and anyone and everyone in between. We have about 120 partners all working towards the same goal of conserving the monarch butterfly and its migration. And we're still growing. We've got more applications coming in um, from organizations all over the country wanting to get involved and, and know what they can do to help also. You don't have to be a partner to do things for monarch butterflies and pollinators. Um, and we have lots and lots of resources on our website that I'll share with, um, as some of you saw them on the uh, table just outside the room on your way in. Um, and we've got them all on our website as well. But a lot of people ask us, why monarchs? Why monarchs? <laughs> That's a great question. They're pollinators, but why monarchs? And we use monarchs as a flagship for conservation. People love monarchs. How many of you love monarchs? Yay! <laughs> so people love monarchs. Every, every event that I go to, every program I do, there's always at least one person that comes up to me and tells me their story about monarch butterflies. And it's usually something like, having had them in their classroom when they were in you know, the second grade, raising them with their teacher, or occasionally I'll hear somebody who used to have roosts of monarchs in the fall coming through their yard and they just remember the tree just being covered in butterflies. So a lot of people have a, a really heartfelt, a really close relationship with monarchs. Um, and monarch butterflies are one of the most widely recognized butterflies in the world, <laughs> let alone the United States. Um, People who aren't bug people know what a monarch butterfly looks like. They love them. And just as a side note, since we're local here in the Twin Cities, the, the picture on the background here, looking up into the sky, that is an art installation at the Mall of America that just got put back in for its final year this spring. So you can head down to Bloomington um, and check that out. It's in the North Atrium, um, and it's just really cool. Um, there's a big, giant butterfly that you can, I, I don't know if they still have it. They used to have a, a rope you could pull on to make the wings move. Uh, but I don't know if they still have that this year. Um, but it's really, really cool. Um, and the, it's a local artist that, that put that up. And um, it's been there for, I think this is the third or fourth year it's been able to be there. Um, so head on down to Bloomington if you, if you want to brave them all and check that out. Um, but monarchs are, are a, a hook, a grabbing organism that, that people just love to get behind. And what helps monarch butterflies help all sorts of native pollinators, from the native bees to hummingbirds to native um, bats and uh, even songbirds. So by helping the monarch butterfly, we're also helping all sorts of other animals. Everything is connected. So I know some of this presentation, this life cycle part, might be review for a lot of you. But just to make sure everybody's on the same page, this is the monarch life cycle. <laughs> We've got egg, larva, pupa, adult, all centered around this magnificent plant called milkweed. How many of you know what milkweed is or have milkweed on your yard or have seen it before? OK. Without milkweed, we would not have monarchs. We can't have monarchs. It is their only host plant. Now, in Minnesota, there are about 13 or 14 different species of milkweed that are native to, uh, to our state, but uh, they will, and they'll use any one of them, but the, the most common one is common milkweed, which is right in the center there. And we'll talk about, um, there's some resources on the table out there, and we can talk about different types of milkweeds that are native. But it all starts with milkweed. Monarchs lay their little tiny egg on the leaves, or the flower buds, or the seed pods, usually on the underside. How many of you can spot an egg on one of those pictures? There is one in every picture. Can you see all four? They're tiny. They're only about the size of a pinhead. Um, 
and they're not there for very long, only about three to five days before they hatch. But when they hatch, out comes an itty bitty caterpillar. You can see um, the picture on the bottom right here. That's somebody's fingers looking at, I think, two or three little caterpillars there in between the leaves at the top of the plant. And then in the upper left corner, there's another little tiny caterpillar. How many of you have seen a monarch caterpillar that small? Or have seen something but didn't know it was a monarch caterpillar? So these are newly hatched monarchs. Uh, they don't start getting their stripes until they start eating milkweed. And they shed their skin, they molt, every three or four days. And they do that five times. So each of these larger caterpillars in the middle is a different stage of the monarch caterpillar. So those are called instars, I-N-S-T-A-R. Monarchs have five of them. And from, there's a, there's a little egg up here in the, on this top leaf here. And then we've got a first instar, a second instar, a third instar, fourth, and a fifth. So they, they have five instars. And this whole stage lasts only about two weeks. So from the time that that caterpillar hatches to the time it's ready to form its chrysalis, it's about 10 to 14 days. And that caterpillar has grown 2,000 times its original size. To put that into perspective, that would be like a human infant, average seven, seven and a half pound human infant, growing to the size of an elephant, fully grown elephant, in just two weeks. So you can imagine the amount of food that that would take, the amount of waste that produces. If you've ever raised monarch caterpillars, you know. <laughs> That's just amazing. 2,000 times its original size. But when it's done growing, it leaves the milkweed, it hangs in its J shape, and then forms its chrysalis. So it molts one final time into its chrysalis stage. Now, I've only seen technically two green chrysalises in the wild. One of them was this one pictured here, and then this J caterpillar was one that I also found. Uh, both of these were here in Minnesota. The J, I just happened to look over at the right time. It was up in Orono in a garden. It does not pupate on the milkweed. It was in a garden of milkweed, but I was just kind of lucky to find it. Um, and then <laughs> the other one was up at the Minnesota Native Landscapes uh, production fields. I had just parked my car, and there was a blade of grass with a chrysalis on it. So it was by pure chance. I wasn't looking for either of these. I've never found one when I was looking for one. <laughs> They're very hard to find. They're very well camouflaged, um, and there's probably no chance that you would have found a chrysalis where that J caterpillar has formed. Um, it's just, it's very difficult to spot. Kids are really good at it, though. They're lower to the ground, and they're, I guess, more open to seeing things. So for the kids in the room, keep your eye out for monarch chrysalises this summer. They'll be back before we know it, hopefully. <laughs> um, so they'll leave the milkweed plant to form their chrysalis. They very rarely will do their, well, they'll very rarely form their chrysalis on the milkweed plant. Does anybody know why that might be? Why wouldn't they want to form their chrysalis on their host plant? Mostly to avoid predators. So the evidence of them is all around that milkweed plant. Their chew holes, their scent, their frass, which is their waste, their, their poop. <laughs> um, it's all around that milkweed plant. So if they leave the milkweed plant, um, they're more likely to be able to avoid predators. It's not 100% foolproof. There are still predators that find them, but it's much safer for them to leave the milkweed plant. So uh, that happens after about two weeks. Um, the top series of photos is what it looks like when a monarch is forming its chrysalis. That takes about a minute and a half to two minutes. It's very fast. Very fast. It's even faster for them to come out of it. Only about 30 seconds, maybe less. Depends on the humidity levels and how warm it is and things like that. Um, but they stay in their chrysalis for, again, another two weeks or so, 10 to 14 days. So from the time they hatch to the time they turn into an adult butterfly, it's about a month, give or take a few days. Um, and again, they've grown 2,000 times their original size. Once they are a butterfly, they don't grow anymore. Once, they're, once they've left their larval stage, no more growing. They're done. So they need to make sure they eat enough food as a larva to get them through the pupal stage and then uh, being able to eat as an adult. There are two different butterflies in this photo. One is a male 
and one is a female. And I want to see how many of you know, you don't have to tell me which one yet, how many of you know which one is the male? Just by a show of hands. Seeing a little bit of uncertainty. If you're sure of it, does anybody want to volunteer why you know that the one that you know is a male? The spots, yeah. So the female is on the left, the male is on the right. Um, and you could tell, oops, I didn't put them in there. You can tell because these dots on their hind wings are present. The female does not have those. Um, there's a couple of other ways to tell them apart, but this is the most surefire way that if you're just seeing monarchs in your yard and their wings are open, you'll be able to see those spots, as long as they're not flying. It's a little hard to see them when they're zooming through your backyard. <laughs> um, so monarchs that we have here in the summer usually return to us late May, early June. We'll see how that timing happens this year with such a late, long winter, but they're already on the move. They've already been spotted in like Iowa and um, further south in, in Illinois and things like that. So the spring migration has begun. begun. How many of you knew monarchs migrated? As a show of hands. Okay, great. They do migrate. They don't, I mean, would you want to spend winter here? I mean, we do, but if you were a butterfly, would you want to spend winter here? I I wouldn't, it's too cold. There are, there are no food available for monarchs in the winter. So their strategy, rather than to hibernate like other types of organisms, they get the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> they go south, like many other birds and um, uh, other butterflies and dragonflies. Um, they have one of the longest insect migrations in the world. Um, it's about two to 3,000 miles, depending on where they're flying from. There's only one other organism that has a longer migration, and it's a dragonfly that's, that's native to India. Um, and they fly like 11,000 miles, it's kind of crazy. But for a butterfly that only weighs half a gram to fly 3,000 miles to find a place to overwinter in central Mexico, it's pretty amazing. Um, there are a lot of great migrations in the world, and monarch butterflies is one of them. So They've left Mexico, they've left central Mexico. They started leaving in late February and early March. They've started laying eggs. Um, this final gasp of the overwintering migration is happening right now. Um, and the eggs that they're laying in this green zone here in the southern US are starting to hatch and grow into adult butterflies that will continue the migration northward. And those butterflies or their offspring are the ones that we see here in Minnesota in late May and early June. So if you're seeing eggs in June, it's most likely that they are the grandchildren of the monarchs that overwintered in Mexico. Maybe not directly descended from the ones that we saw in the fall leave, but they're the grandchildren of the monarchs that overwintered in Mexico. So that's one of the most spectacular things about the monarch migration is that it's not the same butterflies that go to Mexico every year. Because here in the summer, we have two to three additional generations that breed. We see eggs in, the, in June when they first return. We see another peak of eggs in July, and then another one in August. So we see two to three breeding generations of monarchs here during the summer months. And that last generation is the one that migrates south to Mexico. The monarchs that are breeding here in the summer and the monarchs that return to us in the spring only live for about three to six weeks. It depends on resources and temperature and predators and things like that. But they only live about a month. Um, but the final generation is what we call the super generation. They live up to nine months because they have to make it all the way to Mexico, spend the winter there, and then make it all the way back to the southern part of the US where the milkweed is. So from November through March, they're just roosting up in trees, much like this just waiting for conditions to be right again for them to migrate and start mating in the spring. Now there are actually two, you saw on the previous slide, there's actually two, uh, two populations of monarchs in North America, technically three, uh, but two migratory <laughs> generations. One in the Eastern Flyway, that's where we are, and then one west of the Rocky Mountains. And then there's, um, I don't have it on this slide, but I do on this one, just south, um, south Southern Florida, there's a non-migratory year-round breeding population that's resident to Florida. So monarchs west of the Rocky Mountains will overwinter 
along the coast of California. Uh, their migration timing is very similar to ours. It's a little bit shorter. They start leaving in early, late January, early February, and are, have definitely settled in by the end of November. Um, but they overwinter in groves of trees of eucalyptus, Monterey pine, cypress, all along the California coast. There's over 200, probably over 300 different sites dotted all along the California coast. And they're very small sites. Some of them only have a few dozen butterflies, up to several thousand. Um, but the monarchs that overwinter east of the Rocky Mountains go to Mexico. And there's between five and 15 colonies there. And this is what they look like. Just like you think National Geographic butterflies just coating the trunks of trees, bending the branches downward. Um, it's just an amazing sight to see. Um, and there's several hundred thousand, if not millions of monarchs still overwintering in central Mexico. For the most part, they move very little, whether they're overwintering in California or in Mexico. Um, but they will start moving around a lot more as weather starts getting warmer, as uh, the sun gets higher in the sky, as, as spring approaches, they'll start flying around a little bit more. They'll come off the trees and start drinking water from streams and puddles. Um, they do a behavior called puddling, which we see other butterflies do here in Minnesota, but they, they, monarchs don't really seem to do that during the summer, but they'll um, land on mud or on uh, little puddles of water on rocks and, and look like they're drinking the water, and they are, but that's a way for them to get nutrients from the soil. Um, and then they'll find, oh, I thought I had some flowers in here, but they'll find nectar sources if they're available, but for the most part, they're just sitting in trees. There's not enough nectar in those overwintering sites to sustain a population of that size for the entire winter. So monarchs that overwinter are in a state of delayed, uh, delayed development called diapause. It's called reproductive mo diapause for monarchs because they're <laughs> delaying reproduction until conditions are right again for the spring. So there's no milkweed, <laughs> so they wait for it to be warm enough to start flying around and for the milkweed to come up, and then they start um, migrating north again. Uh, for the most part, temperatures are actually really close to freezing in central Mexico. It's not like going to Cancun <laughs> or the beaches of, of tropical parts of Mexico. Um, it's cold. It's, the, it's a mountainous region, um, and it's anywhere between like 32 to 45 degrees there um, during the winter months. Uh, so that's how they stay alive for so long. They're delaying reproduction, and it's cold enough that they don't need to use up all of the fat stores they built on the migration southward. So to quickly recap, August through November, they are migrating south or west, depending on which population you're talking about. They overwinter in Mexico or coastal California. And then um, starting in early February or uh, early March, they start migrating north again. And then lay their eggs in southern parts of the United States. Those eggs grow up and continue the migration northward. Is it, my animation's gonna work, there we go. <laughs> they continue their migration northward. Um, two to three breeding generations of monarchs here in the northern parts of their breeding range, and then the whole cycle starts over again in the fall. So four to five generations of monarchs completes one migratory cycle. Yes? Great question. Um, so for those of you watching the recording, the question was, how is the forest being maintained where they're overwintering? And the answer is different depending on which population we're talking about, but I'll focus on Mexico for now, and we can talk about California later if you want. Um, the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve was established um, last century, um, in the 1980s, I believe, um, to protect the monarch butterflies overwintering ground. So it is federally protected by the Mexican government. But the way land is managed and owned in Mexico is very different than how it is here. So if we say the land is federally protected by the United States government, we know that people don't really live there. But the op that's not true in Mexico. For the most part, oh, there's turkeys behind me. <laughs> different flying things. Um, for the most part, um, the parts of Mexico where monarchs are overwintering are still lived on by the communities that, li that live there, the ejidos, 
um, and they're lived on and managed by those people. They're not managed by the federal government. They are protected by the federal government and the federal government will cooperate with the, the folks who live and manage that land. But the people who live there rely on that land just as much as the butterflies do for their livelihood. Um, so they do have a stake in keeping it protected. It doesn't always work out that way. There are some logging operations that happen and things like that. And <laughs> so there, there are some logging operations and things like that that happen um, without permission and things like that. So it's always a work in progress. But there are groups <laughs> working to conserve the, the monarch overwintering grounds and reforest um, the, the forest there in Mexico for the butterflies. <laughs> never has, I've never been upstaged by a turkey before. <laughs> and then is it in California? Is it so California, it, it, no actually. Um, the California overwintering sites range from being on you know, state property or federal property where they can be protected to private property like golf courses, you know, grocery store parking lots, people's backyards. Um, so it's not as well protected and, and protecting it is very complicated because of all of that. Uh, but there are groups in the West that are working on making that a blanket, blanket um, protection um, and working with the, the people who have overwintering sites on their property to protect them and manage them properly. So we're working on it, we're getting there. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that we get a lot is, how do we know how many monarchs there are? That's a wonderful question. I love this question. Um, so this picture here is a picture of the overwintering sites in Mexico. And I know coming from a northern state, we see brown orange trees and we're like, oh, it got too cold. They're frostbite. They're going to die. Those are butterflies. They are orange because they're butterflies. This photo was taken by Lincoln Brower, Dr. Lincoln Brower. Um, who passed away a few years ago, but this was taken in the 1980s. You don't see them quite like this anymore, um, but those trees are orange because of butterflies. So the way that they count the monarch population in Mexico is not by how many there are, it's by how much space they take up. So scientists and conservationists in Mexico will find a point on that mountainside and geotag it and then go around on foot and measure the area that the butterflies are taking up. They will find the trees that have butterflies in it and include <coughs> those trees in that area. And then they add up the total area between all of the colonies and we get graphs like this. So this data set goes back to the 1990s, 30 years, almost, well, 29 years. Um, and I, I'm just curious, what do you notice how about this graph? Something down. A little up and down. Yeah, a little bit of up and down is normal for any population, but I don't need to draw a trend line on this graph for you to see that monarch butterflies are declining. Um, one, so this is measured by um, uh, hectares, so that's about two and a half soccer fields or football fields, depending on which sport you're talking about. Um, and so, the lowest that the monarch population has ever gotten was the first year I started working in monarch conservation, the winter of 2013 and 2014. Uh, they reached 0.67 hectares. That's not very big at all. That's like just a few trees. Um, it's gone up since then. It hasn't gotten that low since then, which is a good thing. Um, there have been years that it's gone up, years that it's gone down. But even on years that it goes up, people get really excited. It doesn't mean our work is done. How monarchs are counted in the West is a little bit different. They are estimated by the number of individuals. The overwintering sites in California are much smaller, uh, typically more easily accessible. They're not on the side of a mountain. Um, they're just on the coast of California. Um, which I know there's mountains there, but they're nothing like the mountains in central Mexico. Um, so volunteers with the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count, organized by the Xerces Society, go out to the overwintering sites um, in the three weeks surrounding Thanksgiving, and then they do another count um, around New Year's to kind of see how the population has changed over the season. Um, but they go out uh, for the official count around Thanksgiving, and they estimate how many butterflies are in those trees, and then tally them up. And again, you can see there's definitely a decline. Um, 
three years ago, there were fewer than 2,000 individual monarch butterflies that were counted all along the coast of California. That was a hard number to read. Um, the two previous years before that, there were just about 30,000 monarchs. All of the years previous to that, there were somewhere between 50,000 to 200 or 300,000, um, but historically, millions, like they're thinking five million historically, used to overwinter along the coast of California. Now, the other thing that's interesting about these graphs from the West is that they also total up the number of sites that were monitored. That's what the blue line is. So you can see, even though, excepting the three years in the middle there, monarch populations have remained relatively steady between 100,000 and 300,000. The number of sites it has taken to get that number has gone up. So they're more scattered, um, and the individual colonies have fewer in them than they used to. There have been a lot of milestones in monarch conservation in the last 50 years. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Flight of the Butterflies, raise your hand, anybody seen it? It was at the Science Museum a few years ago. You can stream it on streaming services. Um, it's a 45 minute IMAX Omni Theater thing. If you get the chance to see it in an Omni Theater, definitely do. Um, but you can find it um, on streaming services. Um, it tells the story about how Dr. Fred Urquhart found or discovered the overwintering sites in Mexico. And I, I put discover in air quotes because the people who live in Mexico have always known that the monarchs were there. It's just that Dr. Urquhart's tagging program brought that knowledge to the rest of the world. Um, most of the monarch milestones have happened in the last 10 years when the petition, the petition to list the monarchs um, came out in uh, 2014. Um, and there have been a lot of really landmark papers that have been published on the monarch population that have happened in that time. They are not yet listed as endangered federally in the US. The IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, did list them on their endangered species list, but they're a committee. They have no governance over anything, but they do have very good scientific processes to determine whether or not um, species warrant listing. So having them listed under the IUCN is not the same as having them listed under the US Endangered Species Act. Um, and it doesn't affect how we do monarch conservation in the US. We still need to plant habitat, we still need to get the word out and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't change what we're doing. Now, monarchs are currently going through the listing process under the US Endangered Species Act. That petition in 2014 started off a 90-day finding um, that um, determined it needed further looking at. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the governing agency over this, um, did a species status assessment from 2015 to 2018. Then they took about two years <laughs> um, to analyze all of the data. And then in December of 2020, uh, they announced that listing of the monarch butterfly was warranted but precluded by other higher priority species. So they qualify for listing under the Endangered Species Act. But there are, at the time, there were eight other higher priority species that needed to be listed before the monarch butterfly based on the resources that the Fish and Wildlife Service has and the status of their populations. They are currently a candidate species, um, so they're going through annual review and it is expected that they will be listed in fiscal year of 2024. If you know the federal government, the fiscal year of 2024 starts in October of this year. So we will know this fall, as early as this fall, whether or not they will be listed under the Endangered Species Act. But no matter the outcome of that, our work will continue. Um, and I'll talk about what all of that work is um, in a second here. Before I get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's causing the decline and why people are so worried about it. I can tell you what's not causing it, and that's natural threats like predators, parasites, and, dis and diseases, and weather. Now, weather is different than climate, and I'll talk about that in a second, but monarchs have lots and lots of predators. Um, only about two to 5% of the eggs that are laid actually make it to be an adult butterfly. 
that's pretty typical of anything that lays hundreds or thousands of eggs. Sea turtles, crocodiles, fish, <laughs> other insects, right? So for only two to 5% of those to make it to adulthood is pretty typical. Um, monarchs have uh, predators in mostly other invertebrates, but occasionally things like frogs and birds and lizards will eat them, but they don't usually eat more than one. They don't taste good, they are toxic, they make them sick. But the things that make monarchs toxic don't seem to have the same sort of effect on other invertebrates. So we get things like spiders, um, mites, paper wasps, things like that, that can affect them. Now there's also new research coming out that's showing that um, uh, invasive species can be a concern, like paper wasps. So when I say, um, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> when I say that uh, paper wasps are a predator, they, they could be something more than just a regular predator. What is driving the loss of monarch population, um, their, their decline, are habitat loss, pesticide use, and climate change. These are the three areas that we can have the most impact. And the most impact that all of you can have, we'll talk about um, with habitat in a second. But part of why those things are concerns are because things of, like, uh, this map is from a few years ago, fires in the west, um, more severe winter weather in the overwintering sites, um, conversion of prairie habitat to agricultural and development, um, urban, suburban, agricultural rights of way, it's all happening. Um, but that doesn't mean it needs to continue to happen and it doesn't mean that when it does happen, it becomes sterile habitat. That's where we come in. I live in suburbia, I can plant habitat in my yard and so can everybody else. Um, the, the thing that I wanna drive home here is that there's still hope. There's still hope. We can still make a difference. Time is not lost. We have not run out of time. There are lots and lots of people working on this. All of our partners, all of our colleagues in Canada and Mexico, even in other countries, are all rooting for us. There is someone somewhere monitoring some part of the monarch life cycle at any given time of the year. We know a lot about monarchs. There are plans in place to conserve them. The, the uh, Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, um, it's all the green states in the middle of the country, <laughs> um, have a strategy to um, conserve habitat. Uh, we need 1.3 billion stems of milkweed. We can't get there without everybody's help. It's an all hands on deck problem. That includes homeowners, business owners, uh, rights of way, Agriculture, believe it or not, we need to work with agriculture in order to get to the population goals that we have. Um, so everybody is part of the, the solution to this. So what can all of us in this room do? We can explore and learn more. We're already starting. How many of you have already started before tonight to learn more about pollinator habitat and the things that you can do? How many of you are going to continue to explore? Yeah, learning is never done. So explore and learn more. The MJD website is a really wonderful information clearing house for all sorts of information that you might need for um, pollinator habitat. Um, we've got this who are you section, oops, who are you section on our website, um, a conservation education page. We've got habit, uh, program pages for habitat science and education. A uh, backlog, not a backlog, an uh, archive is the right word, of webinars that go back to 2014 or 2015. We still do that series once a month. They're free. You're welcome to join them. It's the fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Uh, the next one is next Tuesday, if you're curious. <laughs> um, we've got tons of links, handouts. Um, you can print them straight from our website or we can ship some to you. Um, and we're always adding new things to our website. Um, Oh, there's all the animations I thought I had. There they are. <laughs> so if you're looking for the webinar series, that's where it is. Um, like I said, all of the previous ones that we've already had, have, are, they're all recorded, they're all up on our website, um, and you're welcome to watch them at any time, and then sign up for the new ones as they come out live. Um, the best thing that you can do for pollinators, though, is to plant habitat and then explore it. Watch how many things come back to your yard when you start a native planting. It's amazing. I have ducks nesting in my yard this year. 
didn't do anything to call them there. They're just there. Unfortunately, it's right by my front door, so I'm afraid that she's going to like abandon the nest. But I can't move it because you can't move bird nests. Um, so I just have to keep my dog away from it. So I have some resources at the back of the, the room there at the table. Um, you're more than welcome to email me. I can send you some more links. Um, but the key things to think about when planting for pollinators are a continuous bloom of native, diverse plants. So you don't want to plant just all milkweed. Milkweed is great for monarchs and other types of organisms that use it as a host plant. But it only blooms for a few weeks out of the year. So it's not a great nectar source for most of the summer. You want to think about host plants, nesting sites for native bees, nectar sources. Um, you want to think about ground nesting, organ, ground nesting bees, cavity nesting bees. I, every year I trim back my previous year's plants to about eight inches and I leave the stems there. And then cavity nesting bees will come in and dig out the pith, the, the middle parts of the stem, and they nest in there. I get to watch them every spring come out. It's really cool. Um, Leaving piles of grass or dead leaves, as long as the ordinances of your community allow that, you can have bumblebees nesting there. And then, of course, larval forage for um, butterflies and moths. Um, it's really important to include a lot of variety of host plants because while monarchs aren't a great food source for birds, moths are. Other types of butterflies and moths are. Um, and so having a wide variety of larval host plants will increase the songbirds in your area uh, because caterpillars are a food source for nesting birds and young. So um, having a variety of things allows that to happen. There are over 100 species of milkweed native to North America. I mentioned earlier 12, 13, 14 of them are native to Minnesota. Um, there are other states that have something like 30, but we live in a cold state, so it's not as quite as diverse here as far as milkweed goes. Um, some places to start. All of these resources are available on either linked from or available directly on MJ, MJB's website. And I'm happy to share their links directly with you if you would like. The Xerces Society has really excellent plant guides based on your region. So does the Pollinator Partnership. You just find your region. Um, Pollinator Partnership also lets you type in your zip code, and it takes you right there. My absolute favorite resource, though, is the National Wildlife Federation's Native Plant Finder. All you do is type in your zip code, and it populates a list of plants for you based on their availability on the market and how high of a priority they are for pollinators. Um, you can look for local nurseries using either the Monarch Joint Ventures vendor map or the Xerces Society Milkweed Seed Finder. A lot of the resources on there are the same, but both are a great resource for finding native plants. There's tons of native nurseries here in the Twin Cities, um, and we're really lucky to have two or three great um, landscape restoration companies, MNL and uh, Prairie Restorations, and then I like to use Prairie Moon as well. Um, I get a lot of plants from both of those. Tropical milkweed isn't as much of an issue here in Minnesota because we have winters like we do. Um, but if you know anybody in places where it doesn't get like this outside, <laughs> um, tropical milkweed is something to avoid in most cases um, because it can perpetuate diseases and winter breeding. And that's not what we need for monarchs to increase their population. Um, so if you plant tropical milkweed in Minnesota, it, it's more like an annual. You'll need to replant it again. It's a tropical plant. It cannot survive our winters. Um, but if, you are, if you're a snowbird or you know family or friends who are snowbirds, um, consider encouraging them to plant native things to their area. And watch for treated plants. Plants can be treated with pesticides and then marketed that they're keeping pests away, which is in some cases a good thing, but those pesticides also harm beneficial insects. There's a handout in the back of the room on neonicotinoids. It's purple, um, so you can check that out and, and just watch for it. Um, if you find plants that have been treated with pesticides and they're not systemic, you can still plant them. Just know that it'll take some time for those pesticides to wash away. If you find plants that have been treated with neonicotinoids, like these, these tags here, those are systemic, which means they stay with the plant for the life of the plant. And they will harm anything that eats it, from the nectar to the pollen to the leaves to the roots. And there have been studies that show that the the pesticides are also leaching into the soil and affecting the plants around it. So watch out for those. Um, if you have some in your yard and you're not sure, um, or if you have something in your yard that you're not sure, um, it's OK. Or if you accidentally bought some, that's fine. You don't know what you don't know until you know it, right? 
Um, so you can just work to replace those plants when pesticide-free ones become available. Yes? Are there any efforts to get rid of that? Yes. <laughs> there are efforts to get rid of neonicotinoids. Um, it's actually a banned pesticides in other countries. Um, but it is safe for human consumption, so it's used a lot in agriculture um, to keep like pests like tomato hornworms and things like that away. It's derived from the nicotine plant, nicotine from the tobacco plant. That's where it gets its name, um, neonicotinoids. So um, there are there's a lot of research that's coming out on it too, and um, you can find more information on our website and other organizations in the Twin Cities. But yes, there are efforts to um, get rid of it, and actually. Most, if not all, of the big box stores now have vowed to be, if not neonic free, at least advertise that they have neonics on their plants, which is why you get tags like this. Um, so it's at least becoming more aware of the problem. Um, the next best thing that you can do to help pollinators and monarchs in general is to contribute to community science programs. Monarchs are one of the most intensively monitors, monitored insects monitored organisms, really, um, out there. Um, there are tons and tons of different programs. I have a handout in the back of the room that you're welcome to grab. There's more information on our website. Not all of the programs listed on this, side, on this slide are publicly participating programs, um, like overwintering colonies in Mexico. Those are just a few select people that, that go out and do that. Uh, but if you live in California, you can volunteer with the Xerces Society and learn how to count overwintering colonies in California. Um, the big ones in our part of the world, um, Project Monarch Health looks at parasites and diseases. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project looks at um, breeding monarchs. You can go out and count eggs and larvae on milkweed. You know, a lot of people do that anyway, so you might as well report it. <laughs> um, iNaturalist is another easy way to participate in a monarch community science or just community science in general, it's a really easy one to participate in. Um, same with National Phenology Network, they, they look more at plants and the phenology of things. And then Journey North tracks the migration in both directions with sightings and Monarch Watch tracks it with tags. So if you've ever tagged butterflies, you've done it with Monarch Watch. Um, the other two are based in the West, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper and the Southwest Monarch Study. So if you have friends in the West, you know that there's additional programs that they can participate in as well. And then finally, connecting and sharing with the people that you know um, and advocating for monarchs within your community, both at the federal and, and local level, um, advocating for pollinators and, and being able to provide habitat. Share what you know with everybody that you know. <laughs> uh, get the word out there. And know that together, if we work together, we can protect monarch butterflies. We can make a difference. Um, we will make a difference. And with that, we have lots of time for questions. Yeah, let me head back to that slide. Um, the question was, for those of you watching the recording, what causes those deep spikes and those big rises? Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's the conditions of the weather and the milkweed that year. Um, sometimes it's events like really big freezes or um, drought, things like that. Unusual. Yep, something unusual. So um, there were a few years in here, like the winter of 2000. Three and 2004, there was a really bad winter storm in Mexico. That's where one of my pictures was from. Hundreds of thousands of monarchs died in that storm because it just got too cold, too windy. Um, and you could see that that dropped precariously <laughs> from the winter of 2003 to the winter of 2004. Um, so that's normal. It's normal for those fluctuations to happen. Like the classic example is like the, um, uh, the fox and the hare. So when the fox population is really high, the hare population is really low, and then because the population is really low, the fox population goes down, and then suddenly the hare population shoots up again. It's that predator-prey cycle, but it's a lot more complicated than just one factor. Monarchs have weather, they have predators, they have um, conditions along you know, thousands of miles of North America to contend with along the migration. Um, so it's, it's about more than just one event, um, you know, it's, it, we've got spring conditions to consider, fall conditions to consider, drought in one part of the country, floods in another part of the country, so it's complicated. But yes, um, typically when there's big spikes like that, it's something really big happened, or really bad, or both. Yes? When they migrate, do they migrate like birds 
group together or do they go separately? Great question. So the question was for those of you watching the recording, uh, do they migrate like birds all together or do they go separately? Uh, it's different in the spring and in the fall. In the fall, they tend to all be heading the same direction, which is why when you, um, you might see fall roosts, um, let me see if I can find, yes. So you might see fall roosts, like the picture in the upper left and the one on the bottom there. You can report those to Journey North, and that's how Journey North tracks the fall migration. This only happens in the fall, though. They don't roost like that in the spring. So they'll start, you know, they're all going in the same general direction in the fall, and there are a lot of them, so it's easy to see them. Um, but in the spring, they tend to be more individual. They're spreading out over a greater area versus all congregating towards one. So you might still see a few monarchs together, but they're not going to roost like this in the spring. Um, like they do in the fall. Um, and then during the summer, they're really just kind of on their own. They're not, a, butterflies in general aren't a social species. Um, so it's really unusual to see so many monarchs coming all together in one place. Oh, so many butterflies come together in one place, which is part of why the monarch migration is such a spectacular phenomenon. Um, and that's really, really the big thing that we're worried about losing is that mig migratory event. Um, you know, there are, there are populations of monarchs actually all over the world. Um, we don't know how exactly they got there. We can assume that humans got them there somehow on ships or on purpose or whatever. <laughs> Some of them may have blown across the ocean on, um, on winds and things like that. But, um, and then there's, of course, the, the year-round breeding populations in parts of our country also. Um, but it's the migration that's really at risk. Monarchs too, but like the migration in general, yeah. Go ahead again. Are there other butterflies or insects that migrate like monarchs do? The question was, are there other butterflies or insects that migrate like monarchs do? And the answer to that is the like monarchs do, um, is that no. Monarchs are the only butterfly that does a multi-generation and back sort of, uh, sort of migration. There are other butterflies that will migrate one generation and then stay there for a while, and then another generation, and then stay there for a while, but definitely not on the scale of monarchs. Like there's, um, a, oh, there was a, I was just in Texas in the fall, and there was a migration happening, but it was just like from one side of the road to the other. <laughs> it was technically a migration. You could definitely tell it was happening. Um, and then like painted ladies will migrate also. Um, some years in some parts of the country, you see a lot of that. But all of the butterflies all at once doing it, like monarchs do, no. Um, not nothing on the scale of monarchs. <coughs> it's a pretty special thing. Mm -hmm. Is your organization or do you recommend organizations that organize volunteers to go out and create habitat in public spaces or private spaces? Good question. So uh, the question was do does the MJB or do we know of organizations that organize volunteers to plant habitat? <coughs> and Right now, MJV doesn't have the capacity to do that a lot. Occasionally, an event will come up. It's possible we might have one coming up um, sometime this year, but it'll be in Falcon Heights, um, just north of the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus. Uh, I don't have details on that. It, it's like literally just starting right now, the planning for that. Um, but we're hoping to turn that into a public event. There are tons of organizations that do plantings. Um, Wild Ones um, is one that they have a chapter, we have a chapter here in the Twin Cities, they do plantings. Um, and then other than that, it, it's really just kind of, you know, different cities or different organizations that might be doing plantings. Um, schools might also, if you, if you have children or grandchildren in schools that might want to plant a pollinator habitat, they might have um, an opportunity to help with some of that too. Um, but in general, there's not like an organized effort to do things like that on a large scale. It's just kind of on a case-by-case -case basis as things come up. There tends to be a lot of things happening around like Earth Day or Arbor Day, although both of those days are too early to plant plants, <laughs> like herbaceous plants here in Minnesota. Um, so we're best off waiting till like late May or June <laughs> to plant things. Um, and we can plant here in Minnesota all the way till the first frost. Um, as soon as the first frost, at least native plants, um, as soon as the first frost comes, you want to kind of wait until the spring again, unless you're winter sowing on, on the, the snow, but we can plant. We've got a good chunk of time that we can plant. Yeah. Are there, um, you see the ones maybe that are better than others, like common versus swamp, or are they all pretty much the same? Good, 
Good question. The question was, are there species of milkweed that are better than others, or are they all kind of the same? They are all viable host plants. We don't have enough evidence to show yet on a large scale that monarchs prefer one species over another. Um, it's totally possible that you might notice that um, monarchs in your yard prefer one type of milkweed over another, but then it's entirely possible that in your neighbor's yard the opposite is true. Um, so in general, having a variety of milkweed is best because, um, and especially when you think of things like pests, um, if, if things like aphids are getting on your milkweed plants, um, th the solution <laughs> is to have more milkweed plants so there's more food for the aphids. Um, aphids are another one of those non-native invasive species that could be affecting populations. They don't harm monarchs directly, but they can definitely affect the fitness of the milkweed plants. Um, so my advice in general is to plant as many different kinds of plants as possible. You don't have to start with like 100 plants right off the bat. I start with three. I plant three new plants in my garden every year, partly because it's expensive to plant that many things in my garden, you know, to plant 50 different kinds of plants, um, and partly because it's just, I, I'm not with it enough to plan that far ahead. So I just buy them as I come across them. I'm like, yeah, it'll look good there. Um, I'm not a very good planner when it comes to habitat. I'm hoping that I, my husband and I are planning on doing more in our yard this year. We're gonna like, I, I live in Apple Valley for reference, um, but we're gonna um, kill some of our grass and then start planting some formal plantings of pollinator habitat around our backyard um, because we have a big hill and it turns brown by August and no one likes to mow it. <laughs> so it's better off as pollinator habitat. Um, there is, so how many of you are aware of the Lawns to Legumes program here in Minnesota? I'm actually a coach for that. Yay, wonderful. So for those of you not aware of the program, the application just opened. I think it's, do you remember what time when it closes? Well, so there was a spring cohort yep. and then they're doing another. For the fall, yeah, right? It's on um, the Blue Thumb. The Blue Thumb website, website, yeah. Or Metro, Metro Blooms. Metro Blooms, right? yeah. yeah. So the Lawns to Legumes program is a state legislation program. Um, it's funded through legislation here in Minnesota that um, provides funding and support for homeowners to provide pollinator habitat in their yard or garden. Um, and there's a few different ways that you can find that. And there's more information on the Blue Thumb Metro Blooms website. Um, but it's lottery based. And <laughs> yeah. I've applied for three or four years now and I haven't gotten it yet. Um, and that's why they're doing, why they're doing multiple yeah. um, cohorts. cohorts. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This year. Yep. And <laughs> it's a very popular program. You can see why. Lawns to Legumes, L-E-G-U-M-E-S. Um, and if, if you email me, I can share that resource with you too. Um, the lottery just opened last week, I think, and it will stay open until sometime in the summer, I think, yeah, like June so or July. Yeah, because yeah. I think it's late summer. Yep, I think in the, well, they find we find out in August. I think if you if you qualify, um, and they'll reimburse you up to a certain dollar amount for your plant, and then they have a coach for you to help you figure out what might work best, um, what to plant in your yard, and um, those types of resources are available if just in general um, if you if you want to pay for those services with a landscape restoration company or something like that, um, or do your own research, obviously, like there's master naturalist programs, um, or sorry, master gardener programs, and then um, tons and tons of resources online. But um, Wild Ones is also a good resource for finding examples of plantings. They have really great diagrams and maps on their website, like plant maps um, for what you can, you know, how you can situate your plants and what to plant and things like that. Yes? How do the monarchs find the Yeah, the question was, how do they find milkweed? If you plant it, how do they find it? Um, that is an age-old question. We know a little bit of the answer. Um, they, they have excellent senses, but they're very different from mammals, from humans. Um, they have chemoreceptors in their antennae and on their feet. Um, how they can sense it from so far away, Nobody really knows, but they're very sensitive. Um, they taste with their feet like other butterflies do. So when a female is looking for milkweed to lay her eggs on, she will test that the plant that she's standing on is actually milkweed before she oviposits onto the milkweed. Um, but yeah, it, 
they somehow find it from very far away. Very, very far away. I think like mile, mile or two is, is how far away they can sense it from. So, and uh, that might depend on like wind conditions and things like that, but it's kind of amazing. I mean, how does any host plant, host, uh, like insect find its host plant? And, and you know, then there's like those parasitic wasps that find a weevil inside the bark of a tree. Like, how do they know? I don't know. They, they know, it's instinctual to sense those things, I guess. Wish I could find my keys like that. <laughs> It's about 7.30, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, with the, so we're just trying to figure out that mm -hmm. if you're sort of resident, does, does the size of the plot matter? Are there opportunities for it? There's, there's an increasing number of all the family homes. And yeah. Plus, are there opportunities for? Like balcony gardens, yeah. Great question. Which was, uh, for those of you watching the recording, um, does the size of the planting happen and are there opportunities to do something like balcony or patio plantings for you know, multifamily residences like apartment buildings and things like that? Um, the first question, I'll answer, I'll answer that one first. Um, the size doesn't matter. Every little bit helps. Every drop in the bucket will increase the amount of habitat on there. A little bit of habitat is better than no habitat at all. Um, if you don't have the space for the habitat and like you live in an apartment building or uh, high rise or, or not, there are opportunities to plant container gardens. Um, I know plenty of people that have planted container gardens on their balconies. You just have to be mindful of what types of plants that you choose because most of the native prairie plants in Minnesota have very deep root systems and they don't like to be in a pot. Um, that said, there are milkweed species that you can grow um, well in a pot, like uh, swamp milkweed grows well in a pot. And there are other, and I know less of this, but there are other shallow rooted types of um, nectar plants that you can grow in a pot. And, and that's where it's like, okay, well, I don't have a whole lot of room, so I can't have something blooming all the time. You're still helping. You still have the ability to help, even if it's just a pot, a pot of milkweed on your plant. Yeah. Um, I actually, I get... Uh, Prairie Restoration's um, newsletter, and I just today they just their newsletter was about growing native plants in urban environments. Yes. So they, it was a really good article. Awesome. On, they talked about container planting and what. Do they have a like a blog post on their website on that? Does it link um, to that? You know, I'm gonna guess yes. Okay. Because it's this is just their this is their 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 newsletter. Yeah. Okay. So if you're curious about that. Mike, for residents or just for those of you in the room, um, check out the Prairie Restoration's website, prairieresto.com, right? Um, prairieresto.com and then look for their, their news updates there. Uh, there's lots of options and the options are ever growing. So, and then um, It, it, the, the, other, the other thing that you consider could consider if you have a small area is something like a pocket prairie. Um, and MNL sells pocket prairies. It's just a five foot by five foot square thing that you put in the ground, dig up the grass, put a mat over it, and then it's got it numbered. You, it comes with 12 plants. It tells you exactly where to plant them and a little sign. I think it's like $150 um, and it's just like a ready-made little prairie. And then as it establishes, the, those plants spread and things like that and you can have them there in your yard. And Prairie Moon also has yeah. um, nice options for getting like 38 to 48, 58 plants. Yep. And you can pick the varieties that you want. I've also had good success with Prairie Moon's bare root plants. They're a little bit more expensive, but all of the bare root plants that I planted from there have survived the winter and the spring. Um, Is so. B A R E or B? B-A-R-E, bare root, yeah. They're things that they've dug up out of the soil, washed the soil off, and then packed them to you, I think usually in like peat moss. And they ship them to you in the fall. You're supposed to plant them before it freezes. <laughs> and then um, they do great. I, I've planted several plants that way. They're a little bit more expensive because it takes more work to grow them and then harvest them, but definitely worth it if you have the space for them. Yeah. Yeah.